This is Your FBI is next on ABC. You can help do something about muscular dystrophy, which today has over 100,000 victims, most of them children from 3 to 13. There is no pain, no known cause, no treatment, and no known cure. Even those of you who are not parents must realize the heartbreak of standing by and the knowledge that you can't save a child from certain death. The only hope that exists is in constant painstaking research. Your contributions will make this research possible. Send as much as you can to your local muscular dystrophy chapter or to the Muscular Dystrophy Association, New York 8, New York. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented transcribed as a public service by the American Broadcasting Company. Tonight, the subject of our FBI file, Racketeering. Its title, Mr. Big Shot. Modern man has an enviable record in many fields of endeavor. Yet this highest of all civilizations also has its signs of decay. For in this country, the time has come when one out of every 16 people has been arrested for a major crime. Whose fault is that? Is the criminal entirely to blame? Or is society partly to blame? A society which allows so many of its children to grow up in slums. Social studies made in recent years have placed the blame somewhere in between. But one thing has been made clear by those studies, and that is that crime, like charity, begins at home. The respect for law and order that decent citizens have was instilled in them when they were young. Rich or poor, there is one gift you can give your child that is priceless. Teach him to respect the dignity of his fellow human beings. And if you teach that lesson well, you'll be doing more than your share in helping to wipe out the crime wave. Tonight's FBI file opens in an FBI field office located in a large eastern city. Special Agent Jim Taylor is greeting a visitor. Sit down, Mr. Ames. Thanks. You're a reporter for the morning record? That's right. And you uh, want some information about Gordon Drake. Yeah, I'm doing a feature story on him, and I understand you're the man that knows most about him around here. Well, I worked on several cases that involved Drake. Pretty colorful guy, wasn't he? How do you mean that? Well, the way he operated, he had a lot of class. Class? Drake had class? Sure, a mob guy that traveled with the best people, lived at the best places, did the best things, real first cabin. Best people, Mr. Ames? Well, celebrities, uh, socialites. And that gave him class? According to their standards. Well, then there's something wrong with their standards, Mr. Ames, if they allow a corrupt individual like Gordon Drake to mingle with them and gain a cloak of respectability. <laughs> you see what happens when you get me started? <laughs> keep, keep talking. Well, strange as you know, gangsters and racketeers are infiltrating into many legitimate fields of endeavor. And it isn't so easy to recognize them. They, they don't behave like the mob kings of, oh, 20 years ago. They dress, talk, and act just like you and me. Drake's a perfect example. What was his background? How did he start? Well, this file here can answer that for you. I dug this out when I heard you were coming here. This is Gordon Drake right from the beginning. Born August 5th, 1908. An early probation report here reveals he was a bad kid right from the time he could walk. He wasn't arrested, though, until 1923. The details of that arrest are right here. Back in those days, Gordon Drake lived in a big city, and like many other youngsters in crowded neighborhoods, he used to keep pigeons on his apartment roof. One day, he and a young friend were on the roof. Hey, Joe! Yeah? Keep waving that pole. I want them pigeons to stay up there. They need to work on. Okay. How about them ones in the cage? Oh, they're babies. I just bought them. They're nice, huh? Yeah, I guess so. Them are blue checkers. Oh. Gordon. Huh? Something I can't figure. What? 
Why do you buy them pigeons when the streets are full of them? Ah, that's a clinker's jar. Got a bum. These here are real genuine homers. Oh. Hey, where were you last night? I was looking for you. I stayed home. How come? Well, my uncle was there. Just got out of the army. He's going to stay with us a while. Huh? Boy, you should hear some of the things he tells about being in a war. What a gun he had, boy. German gun. Said he took it right away from the Kaiser. Big gun, Joe? Nah, revolver. Huh. You say he's staying with you for a while? Yeah. Where's he keep his gun? Why? I like to get my hands on one. What for? To do a job, you boob. Oh. Yeah. Think you could find it? Yeah, sure. Then get it. I know where we can put it to good use right away. Tonight. I just thought we'll be here in the dark. Just turn off the gas. All right, all right. Now, now what happens? We wait here on the hall till that king comes down. The rent collector? Uh-huh. Where's he now? In Mrs. Riley's apartment. Gordon, tell me something. What is it? Look, if you put up that rope so the man would trip down the stairs, what do you need my uncle's gun for? Just in case the fall don't knock him out. Oh. I wonder okay, if I... Thanks a lot. Here it comes. Yeah. Oh, Mabel! Let's run him quick. All right, all right. Did he get knocked out? He acts that way, yeah. Find anything. This feels like a good roll of bills right here. Look, don't you think we'd better hurry? Wait, I look in this other pocket. Oh, somebody might come in. <laughs> ah, there's nothing here. Look, we got enough. Let's go. Wait a minute. I got something to do first. What? This. Gordon! What'd you do that for? What's the good of having a gun if you don't use it? Well, Mr. Ames, that was Gordon Drake's first crime in the police records. How long was he set away for? He wasn't. What? Why not? The gun was traced to the uncle of the other boy, Joe. This brought him into the case, and Joe confessed to his part in it, but he didn't implicate Gordon. I see. The rent collector didn't die, so Joe was sentenced to a term in a reformatory. And Gordon went free? That's right. Well, in the next five years, his record shows 18 arrests, convicted only once, very short term in reform school. How come? Politics are pretty rotten in the town he grew up in. Young Gordon did favors for politicians, and they took good care of him. That sounds pretty familiar. Yeah. In 1928, Gordon got his first crack at the big time. He and his pal Joe, who were back together again, were summoned by one Sam Hartford, a big shot on the booze racket. Hartford ran a cabaret, a real prohibition. Gordon, you got a cigarette? Yeah. Hey, thanks. I wish we had a better table. Go right down front where we could watch the show. I asked to be put back here against the wall. What for? Legs, Diamond, Schultz, they all sit at this kind of tables. No one can get at them from the back. But who'd want to get at us? That ain't the point. I want Hartford to think we know the score, that's all. Oh, no. Well, where is he, by the way? The waiter said he'd be right over. <laughs> I don't care if he takes all night. What do you mean? I'm building up some business on the side. What? Yeah, that blonde, two tables over. Oh. <laughs> She's playing hard to get. <laughs> I like it that way. Hey, look, Gordon, I think we should hello, both boys. get... Hello, Ah, oh, hello. hello. I'm Sam Hart. Ah, oh, pull up a chair. Nice. Uh, which one of you is good and drank? I am. You're Joe Griffith? That's right. Bobby spoke to you boys, didn't he? Mm-hmm. And you know all about why I sent for you? That's right. You think you'd like to go to work for me? Well, could you tell us more about the jobs? 
Just a little bit of everything. Protection, some muscle, and once in a while, maybe a gun. Well, how about dough? I can guarantee you two bills a week. With anything special, you make more. I see. You interested? Hmm? What do you say, Cod? Yeah, it sounds all right. All right, then you can both start next week. Uh, Hartford. Yeah. Who's the blonde two tables over? Why? I like to meet her. I don't think it'll do you much good, kid. She's my girl. Gordon. Yeah, honey. Where are we going? I thought we'd drive upstate a ways. There's some real nice scenery about 20 miles up. <laughs> My little nature lover. <laughs> <laughs> Look, once in a while I go for the flowers and the trees. This is a spot I found when I was running beer. Incidentally, there's a real good speak up there, too. Well, why didn't you say so? Did you have any trouble getting out, Claire? Mm-mm. Where was Hartford? At the club. We shouldn't keep doing this, though. Huh? Why not? He's going to find out about us. So what? Honey, he isn't exactly going to like it. Look, Claire, I've been working for Harford for almost a year now. I've gotten to know the guy pretty good. Anything he don't like, I can take care of. That's pretty big, too. I'm a pretty big guy. Big enough to take Hartford? Yeah. And when I take Hartford, baby, I'm taking you over, too. <laughs> Well, Mr. Taylor, you've come up with something now that I remember. Drake taking over Hartford's mob? Yeah, that was around uh, 1930, wasn't it? All right, let's see. Spring of 31. That's when Hartford was killed. And Drake did the job? No, although that was the popular assumption at the time. Police found out much later that Drake had gotten his old pal and fall guy, Joe, to do the dirty work. Oh. Hartford's body was neatly weighted down and thrown into the river. Now, no one knew about this at first. He was just missing for four or five months. During that period, Mr. Gordon Drake lived real high. I can imagine. He married Hartford's girl, cleaned up plenty of money on the mob's activities. But then one day, Mr. Hartford's body came to the surface of the river. Uh, I forget. Uh, did the police ever uh, prosecute? Well, they suspected, but they had no evidence. Situation, however, made Gordon a very uneasy fellow. One evening in his apartment, he was in his bedroom when his wife, Claire... Gordon, what are you doing? What? Uh, what are those bags out for? I'm packing. I gotta get out of town. Hmm? Why? Did you know Hartford had a brother? Yeah. Yeah, he's in Chicago. Not now, he ain't. What do you mean? I just got the word he's here in town. I'll give you one guess who he's looking for. Oh. Well, he's a bad guy, Gordon. Awful crazy with a gun in his hand. Sweetheart, that's why I'm packing. Hmm. Where are we going? There's no way in this, baby. What are you talking about? Honey, this has got to be a loner. I'm not taking any short trip. I'm skipping out of the country. How can you leave me? Look, I... wherever I wind up, I give you my word. I'll send for you later. But this is how it's got to be now. I don't like it. Sorry. Hmm. Does Hartford's brother know where you live? Yeah. He might catch up with you before you make any getaway. Joe's taking care of that. How? Well, I got the word that Hartford's brother don't know me. Don't know what I look like. He just knows my car. So? He's waiting downstairs right now for me to come down and get into it. What's Joe gonna do? I sent him down instead. You mean Joe? Wait a minute. Does Joe know Hartford's brother's there? Does he, Gordon? Answer me. No. Then, then you sent him down. Shut up. Gordon, how could you do it? He's your best friend. Joe handles himself okay. But if the guy's laying for him, he won't have a chance. Look, would you rather I got it? Is that what you're saying? I don't want anybody to get it. When did Joe go down? You gotta stop him. Gordon, do you hear me? You gotta stop him. A little late now, wouldn't you say? <laughs> We 
we have devoted ourselves from the time of the American Revolution to the concept that nothing was so dear to us as freedom. We have fought and shed our blood to win our freedom and to keep it. And yet we debase ourselves and everything we stand for by allowing these petty tyrants to move among us, to set themselves up as minor league Hitlers in their own small orbits. We have a magnificent history in this country with every reason to be proud of it. But before we achieve a true national maturity, we shall have to destroy every one of these criminal machines. And we shall have to do it for one important selfish reason. They are a luxury America cannot afford. Tonight's file continues at Special Agent Jim Taylor's desk in the FBI field office. Well, Mr. Ames, what do you think about Gordon Drake now? Still think he has lots of color and class? No. Uh, what else have you uh, got on him? Well, he skipped the country, all right. He went to Europe. Did he send for his wife? <laughs> now, what do you think? Oh, but he did take plenty of money with him. From all reports, he lived very well. What about Hartford's brother? Was he picked up for killing Joe? Oh, he didn't kill Joe. Joe killed him. Mm. Joe was sent away for 20 years. Did uh, Gordon know this? Oh, I don't think so. Not until he was out of the country, anyway. I see. When did he uh, come back? Well, let's see. 1937. He got sick of Europe, I guess. He returned to his old hometown and started operating again. I remember that. He was mixed up in gambling, slot machines, and in bookmaking. That's right. And this is when he first evidenced the veneer of proper social behavior. Europe had done this to him. His speech changed. His mode of living was more lavish, yet in better taste. Oh, he really started operating on a grand scale. Now, what about his wife? Did she know that he was back? Well, she found out eventually, yeah. In fact, she paid a call on him one day in a very smart apartment that he maintained on the east side. Well, Gordon? Aren't you going to ask me to sit out? Go ahead. Thanks. How long you been back? Several months. Why didn't you get in touch with me? I didn't know where you were. Oh, now, look, it, it couldn't have been too tough to find out. Then let's say I didn't have time. Nobody's that busy. No, stop hacking. I'm not hacking. I'm I just trying to find out where I stand. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Yeah. Gordon. What is it? We're still married, you know. I know. Well, what happens to that? We just call it off. Suppose I don't want to. Is this a shakedown? No. Then I don't follow you. Look, what I'm trying to say is... Uh, now that you're back, couldn't we give it another chance? Are you kidding? No. Honey, have you looked at yourself lately? What do you mean? You're a little on the broken down side, kind of frayed around the edges. Why, you know, good. Easy now. I'm telling you one thing right now. I ain't giving you no divorce. Yes, you are. I ain't, I tell you. Shut up. <laughs> now get out of here. My lawyer will call you in the morning. So that's how Drake got his divorce. Yeah. It's also an episode that his friends and admirers didn't know about. Did she get any money from him? Not just enough to live on. She was too frightened to do anything except take his money and then keep out of sight. Mm -hmm. Well, somewhere around that time, Drake became something of a, a national figure, didn't he? Well, I suppose you could call him that. He'd become so big and such, such a smart operator that the police couldn't even remotely link him to any specific crime. Then came the war... And Drake really did his bit. He was mixed up in more black market operations than any other thief in the entire country, but it was still impossible to directly tie him to any of them. And this continued after the war was over. That's right. He also became more and more the gentleman. Then one night, and this was only a week ago, Gordon Drake had a visitor. He was announced by Gordon's man, sir. Excuse me, Mr. Drake. Yes, Walker? A gentleman to see you. Well, who is it? Hello, Gordon. Hello. You don't remember me, do you? <laughs> well, don't, I... Don't, uh... don't try to dig for it. It's me, Joe. Joe? 
Joe. Say, it's good to see you, Joe. Oh, thanks, Gordon. Oh, excuse me. Uh, that will be all, Walker. Yes, sir. Joe, where did you get out? Oh, just a couple of days ago. You're the first guy I come to see. Well, I'm certainly glad you did. Uh, before I forget, I want to thank you for sending all that stuff to me while I was away. Oh, forget it, forget it. I'm always glad to help a pal. Oh, I know, I know, Gordon. Well, <laughs> things seem to be going okay for you, huh? <laughs> oh, I can't complain. Yeah, it's a real swell scatter you got here. I'm glad you like it. I've put quite a bit of money into the place. <laughs> sure looks like it. You see that picture over the fireplace there? Uh-huh. That's a Picasso. Oh? And that's a Renoir over the books there. Uh, Gordon, I'm afraid I don't know these guys. They, they must have come up after I was sent away. What? Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, Gordon. Yes, Joe. Uh, this visit here tonight, uh, I, I hate to admit this, but it ain't altogether social. Uh, what do you mean? Well, as you know, I've, I've been away almost 20 years. <laughs> Things have changed a lot. I'm kind of confused by it. I, I just don't know where to begin again. So... Yes? Well, uh, I kind of like to get in action. I was wondering if... We could sort of work together again. Uh, I see. Well, how about it, Gordon? Well, uh, Joe, I understand your position. I, I wish I knew how to say this. Look, if you've got anything on your mind, you just say it straight. Very well. Joe, you were right when you said that things have changed a lot. Uh, we're in a new era, an era that calls for different methods, different personalities. Go on. The day of the... These, those, and them guys is out. You have to have class now. An ability to mingle with the right people. Now, you still need muscle, of course, but uh, you can buy that easily. What I'm trying to say, Joe, is that... Uh, well, you don't quite fit into that picture. Now, if it's a matter of your needing money, I'll be only too glad. No, to... no, no. No handouts, Gordon. Well, surely you must need something. I, I... can always get dough. All right, if that's how you want it. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I want it. <laughs> uh, Joe, I, I wonder if you'd excuse me, please. I have to dress for dinner. Your floor, Mr. Drake. Thank you, Charlie. Was it a good party? Oh, just fine. Well, good night, sir. Good night, Charlie. Hello, Gordon. What? Uh, Joe, what are you doing here? Waiting for you. How did you get in? Well, this may bother you a little, but I used old-fashioned methods. What do you mean? I tapped out your servant. Now, look, Joe, what's this all about? I saw Claire tonight, Gordon. What? Your ex-wife, Claire, remember? Well? She filled me in on a lot of things. The most important one was the story on Hartford's brother. Now, wait just Hold a moment. Hold it, Gordon, I got a gun here. That gives me the floor. All right, it was quite a deal you handed me on Hartford's brother. It took me 20 years to get over it. Joe, whatever she told you was nothing but lies. No, no, she was leveling. And you know something? Her story got me to thinking. I went all the way back with you, Gordon, back to when we were kids, when I clipped my uncle's gun, remember? That was just the beginning. I finally gotten wise to the fact you've been handing it to me all along the line. Joe, you're crazy. You don't know what you're saying. Oh, yes, I do. I also know that all your swell friends, your swell apartment, your fancy pictures don't add up to nothing. You know why? Because I got a gun, Gordon. A little old-fashioned gun. And in my little old-fashioned way, I'm gonna square everything. No. No. Wait. Wait a yeah, minute. Yeah, that's right. Start wait, crying. Wait a minute. Go on. No. Cry, you no good crummy. <laughs> cry. Cry. <laughs> Well, 
Well, as you know, Ames, after Joe shot Drake, he killed himself. Yes. Well, there's your story on Drake. Classy, glamorous Gordon Drake. Mm-hmm. I uh, see what you mean. Well, Taylor, I want to thank you a lot for giving me all these details. Oh, glad to do it. Oh, by the way, uh, I have a finish for your story, too, if you'd like. Oh, uh-huh. what is it? Gordon Drake has been in the morgue now for six days. I know. Well, nobody's claimed his body. I don't think anybody will. And now we have a brief message for you from Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, about tonight's program. Mr. Hoover said, and I quote, The character in tonight's case is typical of scores of criminals whom we have investigated over the years. Once a symbol of underworld empires and criminal gangs, he is coming back to life on the scene today. His type is a real menace and the concern of every law enforcement agency in America. His menace is real, just as the rebirth of gangsterism is real. And he will continue to flourish so long as he is supported by people who purchase what he has to sell. The fight against gangsterism must be on two fronts. First, vigorous, effective law enforcement agencies must be maintained and supported. Second, law-abiding citizens should see to it that the gangster element is not aided by giving them business and hence economic support. Only when we have developed a real pincers movement, law enforcement agencies on one side and law-abiding citizens on the other, both united and both determined that the fight on crime will never be relaxed, can we say that we are working for a crime-free America? Have you given blood recently? If you can answer yes, your country is proud of you. But, yes, there's a but in this message of praise. The need for blood continues to be urgent. Besides our fighting men in Korea, we have thousands of hospitalized veterans fighting for life. Your blood can help them. In addition, there's a daily demand for blood in civilian hospitals. And beyond all this, we need to build blood plasma reserves against the possibility of disaster or enemy attack. Just one atomic attack on one American city would require vast quantities of whole blood and thousands of units of plasma in the first 24 hours alone. To meet and coordinate these needs... A national blood program has been set up with the Department of Defense, Civil Defense, and the Red Cross cooperating. You can help. Phone your local Red Cross for an appointment. It's easy and painless. Americans are rolling up their sleeves. Join them, won't you? Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Its subject, auto theft. Its title, The Divorced Child. The incidents used in tonight's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of places or persons, living or dead, is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacy Harris. Others in the cast were Tony Barrett, Bill Conrad, Ted DeCorsia, Joe Forte, Betty Lou Gerson, and James McCallion. Bill Spargrove speaking. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Stay tuned for the adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. There's fun for the whole family when Ozzie and Harriet come your way next. This program came to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network.